So uh, Dr. Mark Tishkowitz is a professor of medical genetics at the University of Cambridge in the UK and an attending staff at East Anglian Clinical Genetic Service in Cambridge. He trained in the UK and then joined the faculty of McGill back in 2005, where he remained until 2011. He then joined the faculty in Cambridge in 2011. His interests, as many of you already know, are in DNA repair and cancer predisposition and notably PALB2. And he's also the clinical genetics lead for the CanRisk research group leading implementation studies of polygenic risk scores in breast and ovarian cancer predisposition. So today he's going to be talking to us about polygenic risk scores. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. That's a nice introduction. All right, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you an update on PRS and breast and ovarian cancer risk prediction. Hopefully it won't be too controversial, but there's always some controversies with this. Um, and uh, we hopefully there'll be plenty of time to discuss uh, the, the issues that come up. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare, and I'm going to just go over some of the background of you know how we've got to this position of you know using PRS. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about Canris, the program that we that we're using uh, to um, integrate PRSs into an overall um, breast cancer risk estimate. Talk a bit about challenges that remain and also future plans that we have as well. So just a bit of a recap, really, if you think about and this is a very famous slide um, that's been around for a while. And we all know that, you know, the, the um, dominant genes, you know, there was a big wave of identifying these in the, you know, starting in the mid 90s, going on to the, to the late 2000s. But really after that, you know, we haven't found any more genes um, that, are, that are causing Mendelian, that inherited in Mendelian fashion. Um, and you know, make a significant contribution to breast cancer. So, and, and we're pretty much sure this is this is where we're at with, with, with the genes that we know about. Where a lot of work has been done, you know, since the mid 2000s until the present day, is you know identifying risk SNPs which have a much lower um, risk element to them, um, but they're very common in the general population and therefore much more widely applicable. Uh, so, so this has been a, a very sort of furtive area of, of research so far with lots of publications, from, uh, for, mainly from international consortia, but hasn't really been used in clinical practice until, until you know, very recently. Um, now, in terms of the, the background for PRS, I, I'm not really going to go into the theory. Um, I've quoted a, a good review here if you want to know more about it, um, but it's relatively, I mean, I think from a, from a non-mathematician point of view, it's a relatively straightforward idea that you get these, you know, hundreds of SNPs, that have very small individual weightings, um, but then you combine them in an additive in an additive manner, and from that you develop the polygenic model, essentially. So even though each each SNP in, in itself doesn't um, have a great uh, influence, if you combine them, then the impact can be the effect can be quite big. You then use a testing data set and you validate and you validate them as well. So validation is a very important step with this. Um, and this is the this is really where we're up to the state of play at the moment with the, the paper from uh, Navarat. This is a, a BCAC paper. So this is a big international breast consortium where a, essentially they found 313 SNPs and they've combined them into a polygenic risk score. And then they've been able to estimate the lifetime breast cancer risk according to you know, that, that's, that, those scores. So if you're in the top you know, 99th centile um, for the um, for, for a PRS, then you know your lifetime risk will be up to about thirty three percent just based on the PRS. Conversely, if you're in the bottom centile, it's right down and below, well below population level as well. And you can see the impact that this has on the number of breast cancers diagnosed as well. So, uh, you know, thirty five percent of all breast cancers will be diagnosed in women who are in over the eightieth centile. So it's a way of enriching. It's a way of enriching. Um, you know, when you're looking at it from a population screening point of view, you can use this to really target surveillance of those women that, that where it would be most appropriate. Um, now that's, you know, that's at the population level. People have also looked at the, the same groups have also looked at this when you factor in family history. And here there's also uh, an influence. So this was a, with, with a smaller panel. This is a paper from 2015. And you can see that again, um, according to where, you know, which um, quintile you're in, um, there is an there is an effect here. 
depend and the effect is bigger if you have a family history. So it, ma so it magnifies the effect, if you like. Um, so it's another, so it is partly independent of family history. Um, and I think that, that's an important point to make that you can use family history and PRS in a risk calculation. And uh, more recently, this has also been done for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. So again, if you look at, um, for example, for BRCA1, you use a, an ER, ER negative PRS, and you can see that um, if you're at the, um, the fifth centile or the, or the 95th centile, that your risks will be quite significantly different compared to the, the median risk estimate. You see the same thing for BRCA2. Um, and also you see the same thing with ovarian cancer as well. So this is a way of really refining the risks, making the risks more precise and personalizing the risks. And these are all sort of buzzwords that we've been using a lot over the last few years. And I think this really shows how, how it might work in practice. Um, so thinking, coming back to breast cancer. So if you think about um, someone who, uh, a, a woman here who's 20, who's got checked to, so in fact, by coincidence, not too, not too dissimilar to, you know, the case we've just discussed. Um, so sort of her baseline risk, her point estimate risk would be, would be here in the mid twenties. Um, if you then add in what are called questionnaire risk factors, QRS, which are the lifestyle factors. So agent men are key, number of children, alcohol consumption, et cetera. You can see that that risk spreads out somewhat. And that's what you want. You want a wide, you want a flatter curve, a wider curve, because that means you're getting better discrimination. Uh, then you add in mammographic density, and you can see the curve widens a bit more. PRS also flattens the curve. And then if you combine everything together, you get the flattest, widest curve. And you can see that the, the spread then of risk is actually quite, quite dramatic. This is the same scenario on the right-hand side, this time with, a, you know, again, a woman, a 20-year-old woman with a check to Pathogen Averit, whose mother had breast cancer as well. Um, and you can see that, in fact, here, what's happened is every, all the curves have shifted somewhat over to the right. And again, you get this nice spread of, of discrimination. So you can see, I mean, this is purely by chance, but you can see that this is very relevant to the case we discussed just now. And you can see it's quite conceivable that her risk would fall into a, a much higher risk category than the point estimate that everyone would typically get. Um, and you, you can use this in terms of um, you know, in terms of screening at population screening. So for example, here in, in the UK, we use uh, a cutoff with the you know, general population risk of about 12%. And then, you know, we add in moderate risk and high risk and moderate risk at 17% and high risk over that. And you can um, essentially, again, you know, just l use these different factors to, to increase the, the range of percentages. And you can, and doing this, you'll find that, um, the women, the 15 women, 15% 15 of women that fall into the moderate risk and 1.2% in the high risk based on this, on this sort of work will account for nearly half of all breast cancers in the population. So a very nice way of stratifying women uh, and, and therefore targeting surveillance. Switching slightly, switching slightly to ovarian cancer, similar story. Um, we've got fewer SNPs, um, but again, this is a nice, uh, of course, to Paul Ferrer, this is a nice timeline of all the, these international consortia starting over more than 10 years ago when they did the initial genome-wide association studies, and then bigger and bigger studies using you know, larger consortia the whole time, develop, and more and more SNPs were identified, and then more of the variants, the familial variants explained through this. And again, you can look at the relative risk here, and you can say the median is here, and anyone who's in the, who has a PRS profile and in the 95th centile, they have a risk approaching nearly double that you know, um, at about 2.8%. And conversely, if you're at the lower centile, lower centiles, the risk is, is quite a lot lower. And then again, you know, as with breast cancer, you can add in other factors like contraceptive use, parity, et cetera. Um, and you can combine those with risk estimates as well. Uh, and again, you get the same sort of, you know, the more factors you combine, the, the, the flatter the curve gets and the more discrimination you get. So a very similar picture with uh, compared to breast cancer there. And if you include all that, then you can get, you know, you will get some women, um, again, in the very top percentile who, who get up to about a 4% risk of uh, lifetime risk of breast cancer. And that's interesting. This is a recent review looking at ovarian cancer risk according to different genes. And the threshold is just at about 4%. So you can see many of these genes that we, we, we know well. No, no question about, you know, the. Um, utility of doing risk reducing the um, 
but then you know the actually a prs score you know a high prs score would fall exactly at this sort of this sort of level here at the borderline level so that in itself could create some issues you know when we're using this in clinical practice so really just to summarize you know we've got these you know we've got these well-established breast cancer genes and we know the penetrance of these genes as point estimates um, and you know there's a clear delineation between brsa one two power b2 and then check to an atm um, but it's much more complicated than that and part of this is also to do with the you know with the ascertainment of how we you know how these how people are identified with having mutations and this is just a timeline of where we're up to and how things have changed over time and particularly we're now very much in this sort of you know, for a long time we've been in this area of people having genetic testing because they have a family history and um and um you know so that so there's always so there's quite a high risk for those mutation carriers but we've, we've moved more into sort of un unselected affected so testing you know many more women who've just got on the basis of the fact they've got breast cancer rather than just because they um, have a family history and we're moving into the population model and also the incidental finding model because whole, you know, things like whole genome sequencing are being used so commonly across other areas of genetics. And you know, with things like the ACMG 73 incidental genes being reported, you know, we're going to get many more of these incidental findings. And this is where I think where polygenic risk will come into its own as well, because then you know, often there'll be no family history, there'll be nothing to go on, but yet you're left with these you know, well-established risk figures that have been built on not many years of studying families. Uh, which which won't be applicable in this particular setting. So you know, if you can then add in a, a PRS here, um, and you know, I, I think you're going to get a much more precise estimate for uh, women and men who find themselves you know with incidental um, pathogenic variants in these genes. Um, so how are we going to do this in practice? Well, I'm going to show you a few slides uh, regarding the CAN risk model that we use. Um, this is a this is a program that was set up. Some of you may be familiar with with Bodicea, which is actually the mathematical algorithm behind it. Cal's can it was always very user unfriendly, so we spent a lot of time making this work in the clinic, and we now call it Canvas. So that's really the front end of, of the um, the tool, the algorithm, um, and it's really you know to help us decide um, you know these key questions when we're seeing women in the clinic. Um, it's it's widely used. We've got um, uh, accreditation it's got it's licensed by the um it's, it's got a c marking so for the european side we haven't got fda mark approval yet that's something that is um i think a work in progress and it's being widely used essentially um and th this is the team behind it so many of you will be familiar with doug easton and tony santonio paul Ferro, um and there's a whole team uh who you know where we've all got together and worked on different aspects of this and i'm very proud to be involved with this program so how does it work in practice? So you can draw family trees on this. And this is an example that I'm going to use. So this is a 35 year old who's 165 centimeters tall, weighs 65 kilograms, so she's got a very healthy BMI. Now, sort of typical real life situation where there's a, a family history of breast cancer here, bilateral breast cancer in the mother, but there's no contact with the mother. You know, she's fallen out with the mother, but she knows that the mother had breast cancer bilaterally. And there's also a cluster on the maternal side. Um, so you can you can enter that pedigree into can risk and you can give her your your pro band here who's 35 you can give her a um an, an an estimate based on putting that pedigree in and based on 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 those data there and you can see that she's about um coming in at just around about um sort of 29 30 percent there so in the uk we use that as a cutoff essentially so 30 percent would put her in the high risk group um you know, so she's very much on the borderline just with the data that we have there for her so far. Now she then goes and decides to have a, a full panel done. Um, and you know, so this is unaffected testing. Um, and this does modify the risks quite a lot, actually. So you can see that the, the her lifetime risk will go down from 20 to 30 percent, and that she'll be, you know, and she's moved very much away from the, the high risk group into the moderate risk category. So she'd get some extra mammogram surveillance. Um, but we wouldn't be considering, you know, for example, uh, you know, more aggressive types of surveillance or even surgery in this situation. So that's certainly had quite an impact doing that genetic testing in her. But it's not really the full story because then if you add it in, you know, if you use a, a 313 polygenic risk score, and let's say she was at the high end of that spectrum, you know, so right at the top end here, 
you know, the 97th centile, then even with the even with her negative, you know, with her panel, she'd be back up to where she was before, based purely on that PRS. So she'd be back up into the high risk group here. Um, so it's essentially negated the the genetic testing panel that she's had done. Um, and conversely, if she happened to be in, in a lower um, range of, a, you know, had a lower scoring PRS, then in fact that would have quite a, again, quite a, have a dramatic impact on her. So then that combined with the negative panel would bring her down to population risk, and that could be that could be very reassuring. There are some things we're not considering though. So mammographic density actually plays a big role, is a big risk factor, and it's not something that we, you know, it's for logistical reasons, it's not that easy many women won't have had a mammogram and the way that mammographic density is actually scored you know is quite variable as well so so it's it's a risk factor but it's not one that we're using particularly well at the moment and um but again if you you know you could add this in so if you for example did the unaffected testing she had a, she happened to have a high prs and she had dense breasts well then her you know again her risk is then up to about 40 percent. so that's going to add about another 10 percent to what it was before so you know, even you, I mean, you know, I, I made that point with the first case that even with having a PRS, you know, that's still not the full picture. And, you know, mammographic density is something else that is actually quite a significant risk factor uh, when estimating risk. Uh, there's some also some, some things that this can throw up as well. So let's say that she drank, drinks two glasses of wine a day um, and we don't know much else about her. You know, this is the original case. Um, she's not had any testing, but she drinks two glasses of wine. Well, that moves her, that increases her risk from 29.1% to 31.1%. So for us, that would push her from one threshold to another, you know, just, just that, that, you know, fairly normal sort of lifestyle. Um, and, you know, so that can, you can then, I think, I don't know if it's, a, if, if you like that in the, in the US, but in the UK, we're quite, we're very driven by thresholds. And, you know, if it's over, then they would get extra surveillance. If they're not, they won't. So, and we're quite precise about these things. So this creates quite a lot of, ethical issues for us because you know we can't go around encouraging people to drink wine to so they get their surveillance essentially um but this is sort of the finer points of breast cancer risk estimation um that i think people need to be aware of so that's how cameras is used in practice and i think i've got the website for this at the end and you everyone's you, you know, it's a free to, it's a free um, program to use you can register for it and and play around with it actually i think importantly it's a very useful learning tool um, and you can use it in your clinics as well um, so what about the challenges that are remaining in terms of how we use prs um, so this is a this is a great paper that's come out very recently uh, from a large sort of an international task force essentially and they came up with some long some short-term um, gaps that we need to that we need to tackle and also longer term ones as well. And I think particularly things like determining the clinical utility, um, quantifying the you know, cost effectiveness and, and how we complement clinical based lifestyle recommendations, which is you know, something I alluded to um, just now. Um, so, the, so these are sort of key things that we, that we do need to think about. And there's also you know, the other issues about um, uh, how we use ancestral representation, which, I'll, which I'm gonna come to. Uh, and then they, they, they've come with some longer term issues as well. Um, but these are the ones that we're sort of focusing on at the moment. Um, and I think, you know, one of the big issues is, is, is the, the problem with ancestry, you know, in fact, how that this, all these, you know, the GWASs were done in predominantly North American and European populations and the validation studies were done in those populations as well. And we know it performs less well in other, in other populations. And that's a, that's a real, Big issue that the you know the PRS community is very aware of and, and tackling with, um, and you know, but I, I think it's important to put it in context. I mean, there are lots of other areas of medicine where these things come about as well. And these, these are just a couple of things that um, were in our in our UK press fairly recently. You know, to do with um, you know oxygen saturation meters monitoring in in during COVID, for example, how that you know that performs less well in certain uh, ethnicities. Um, you know, so this is not an isolated problem. That's not a defense. That's not a defense of the problem, but it's just trying to put it a bit more in context, really. Um, and you know, a lot of work has gone on in this area. Firstly, people did look at, you know, what about the main genes that we know about? How do they perform in other ethnicities beyond outside of uh, North America and Europe? 
And um, there's been some good studies coming out of um, the uh, East Asian population showing that broadly, you know, for PSA1 and BSA2, the, the relative risks are broadly similar um, in the East Asian population compared to the, um, you know, the North, North American and European populations. And um, <clears throat> also there's been good work now, good studies done looking at PRS in this context as well. Um, and again, showing the performance actually works reasonably well uh, compared to you know, the Asian studies compared to the European ones. So you're looking at the odds ratio per standard deviation here, um, not too different. Um, so fairly, you know, fairly reassuring in, in that respect. Um, other studies have been done in uh, Latin American women. Um, this was a study led by Susan Neuhausen. Um, and again, um, you know, the odds ratios were you know, not, too, not too different to what one might see in a European population. So, so there are definitely you know, some aspects of this that can work quite well. Conversely, in, in uh, women of African ancestry, the, the PRS it does work less well. Um, and that's something that, that is being addressed. And there's large you know, international um, initiatives to try, to try and tackle this. So I think it, it is something that will certainly improve over time. And I think that, you know, there's a bit of a nuanced conversation to have about when we are comfortable with using these sorts of tools um, across all ethnicities, um, in, a, in which case it will become much easier to implement as, an, you know, as a risk estimation tool, essentially. Um, so other challenges beyond, beyond that, I mean, that's one of the, that's probably the key thing that's holding the field back at the moment, but there are other things like standardization. So, you know, there've been lots of PRSs over time, um, you know, starting with an 18 SNP one um, back in, over 10, more than 10 years ago, and currently with a 313. So if you, you know, one of the questions I always ask is, you know, if, if we, if we are using the 313 in clinical practice, and then say in five years time, you know, there's a 515, you know, panel that comes along, you know, how much, how much will that change an individual's woman's risk? You know, how often are we going to, what are we going to do? Are we, we going to have to go back every few years to recalculate someone's risk, you know, based on new technology? Um, or how are we going to deal with that type of things? Or do we just accept, you know, that this is the standard, you know, the 313 is the standard and we use, we accept, we all agree to use it for, you know, the next 10 years, say. Um, so these are things that, that need to be uh, thrashed out somewhat. Um, and it, you know, and it's this concept of moving moving away from a binary variable. So you have inherited the mutation, or you haven't inherited it, to a continuous one. It's something that we're not so familiar with in, in our work. Also, moving from rare variants to you know common SNPs, and you know, and again, how we future proof all this. Um, so the risk estimates. I think I think this is a real challenge. You know, how are we going to make sure that the risk estimates we give today are the same that we, should, we would give them in five years' time? Um, you know, there are other issues. So, for example, you could get a, you're going to get different, quite different risk estimates for different family members. You know, if you have two sisters with the same family family structure, um, but they might end up with quite different risk cancer risk estimates. So, how will we how will we explain that to family members? Um, you know, there's a, there's a perennial issues of over treatment and over diagnosis that you know apply to the whole field um, that we still need to consider as well. Um, so against all this, you know, we're not currently in the UK, we're not using PRS in a routine setting, but we are setting up some studies to look at how we might want to use it and just really to get a feel for you know, how this is going to work best in a clinical setting. So the first study is this one, Precision called Precision HBOC, and we're going to essentially look at BRC1 and BRC2 carriers, and we're going to um, we're going to randomize them. This is the team here, so it's it's a joint effort between. Cambridge, Manchester, and also uh, the team in Stanford as well. And um, so, so this is going to be females age 18 uh, who are coming in for predictive testing and they'll have standard, you know, standard counseling for predictive testing. And then what will happen is that they will get um, results given the conventional way. And if they don't have, if they haven't inherited the mutation, you know, they won't take part in the study, but if they have, we will randomize them to conventional risk estimates or, or a more personalized risk estimate. And then we'll follow them up to see uh, both with in quantitative, we use quantitative metrics and also qualitative, we'll, we'll interview participants and healthcare professionals to see how this might work in practice. Um, 
so that's you know so that's the eight, precision eighth block there's also a study that we're going to do uh, as part of the, co the the canvas program itself where we basically get you know all the unaffected women with a family history who comes to our clinical genetics clinics we're going to randomize them to an intervention arm um, versus a control arm of standard care intervention arm will be a canvas profile canvas estimate based on prs and a, and a gene panel testing and these questionnaire based risk factors as well so multi-factor risk assessment personalized estimates and again very similarly we'll be looking at you know, the outcomes psychosocial impact uptake of interventions mri screening and there are other studies going on there's a similar study going on in australia at the moment led by um, paul james and also um, studies going on in um, in the US as well. So hopefully, you know, when, if we try these studies out in different groups, we will get, um, you know, we'll be able to combine our experiences. And I think this will go a long way to helping us understand how best to use PRSs in clinical practice. And, and I think this is the better way of doing things than, um, than what was illustrated in the first case we discussed where, you know, people, we, we, you know, we're just jumping in and we're not really sure what we're you know what we're dealing with so hopefully this will give us the answer the downside of this is, is of course that it will take a few years uh, for us to, to come up with with some some proper answers so in the meantime you know we will we will still be dealing with in a, in a time of uncertainty um so this is these are just the summaries here so we so we are you know precision versus we're also doing this primary care actually but we're, we're using prs there um in um so we're going to look at primary care and clinical genetics, essentially. Uh, this is just about to start, and the other two studies will start next year. Um, so really, I mean, just coming to the last couple of slides here, so what do, what do clinicians and patients need? Well, well, clearly, having personalised age-specific cancer risk will be very informative and help a woman make a decision about her management. And you know, this is best done by using multifactorial models. And we then use cancer risk prediction tools, one of the things about can risk is we're also developing a patient friendly tool that they can that they can use themselves and perhaps at some stage in the future we'll be at a point in real you know where there'll be a real time you know people can ask for real time updates of their risk they can enter in new you know things that have happened in their family or happen to themselves and recalculate their own risk um it will have an impact on risk management options um and you know one of the things that we you know, we're probably lacking a bit at the moment. It's also cost effective mistake. I haven't really talked much about health economics, but that also comes into play when we're thinking about personalized risks. So just in conclusion, you know, I think really the, the, the science behind PRS is well established and, you know, there'd be multiple, you know, it's, it's been rigorously studied um, and, you know, there's been consistent evidence that these actually can give you quite potentially large effects on risk. Um, but there are significant challenges that remain in terms of, you know, how they are used in, in you know, particularly in terms of, um, you know, the uh, educational side and the LC side of things. Um, and information studies are on, are on their way, essentially. So, you know, we will have some answers, but it's just going to take a little, a little bit of time. But this is very much a, a hot topic, as many of you are aware. And on the back of that, I will just like to again mention the the cameras consortia so um these are the, the key people and i think this is my last slide yes here we go um so happy to take any questions from from uh, on, the, on the back of that talk thank you thank you mark that was really really outstanding 